Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. The weekend is here and that means the fun begins. I'm Dave Schrader. That's Tim Dennis. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Hello, Tim. Hello. Good to be back. Hey, tomorrow's show is a special show, Tim. Yes, I did it live aboard the Norwegian Pearl. I We were pirating radio. <laughs> see, see what I did there? Uh, I had special guests Kitsy Duncan and uh, Nikki Folsom with me on board the ship, and we took uh, stories from the audience. So tomorrow's show will be that. We'll be talking with Kitsy and Nikki and audience members, true paranormal encounters. So that'll be tomorrow on the best of Paranormal Talk Radio with... Uh, Dave and Tim. That's a brand new episode we just recorded last week while I was aboard the final Walker Stalker cruise. Today, though, is Supernatural News and Parashare. So let's get started. And we want to remind you that you can always be a part of the show by calling 651 300 Four nine seven seven. That's six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven. And then you can leave your story, your paranormal encounter, and we'll use it on an upcoming episode. Trying to solve your own life's mysteries? Let our sponsor, who has been seen on Good Morning America, help you solve your case. Psychic Source is a 24-7 phone, online chat, and video psychic service. They've been in business for 30 years and have over 300 of the most experienced, authentic psychics in the world. Just try it for as low as 83 cents a minute. Plus, your first three minutes are free and your satisfaction is 100% guaranteed or your money back. You have nothing to lose. Use promo code DARKNESS to get your special introductory offer. You have to be 18 years or older with a valid credit card in your name to have a psychic reading. You ready to make that call? Remember to use promo code DARKNESS when you call one 800 355 Nine two one four, or sign up online at psychicsource.com and use promo code darkness for the savings. Where shall we begin this week, Tim, in the world of supernatural news? I'm kind of laughing at this first headline. I'm not going to lie. Okay. <laughs> Tom Brady says his quote unquote good witch wife, Giselle, <laughs> helps mm-hmm. him win titles with altars and rituals. <laughs> That would make sense. Well, no, it has, it has nothing to do with his year-long preparation, his special diets, his game nope. planning, the fact that I'm he glad we agree. ignores his family 12 months mm-hmm. out of the year to dedicate himself strictly to football, Dave. Nope, has not nothing that. To it's do, her black magic. has nothing to do with any talent he has in his body whatsoever. It's all strictly due to his wife's magic. <laughs> I don't know why you find that so funny. It's the most believable thing in the world to me. Uh, Sure. Uh, New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady detailed uh, some of the unique methods his wife employs to ensure the future Hall of Famer succeeds on the field during a charity event Thursday, according to WBZ-TV. Brady, who just won his sixth Super Bowl over the Los Angeles Rams, said his wife Giselle Bündchen, uh, who has described herself as a quote-unquote witch, has, not in behavioral means, but an actual witch, uh, has a series of rituals she performs at games. She always makes a little altar for me at the game because she just wills it so much, Brady says. I think he meant, not literally, but, you know. Uh, 
she's so she put together a little altar for me as he put it that i can bring with pictures of my kids and i had these little special stones and healing stones and protection stones and she has me wear this necklace and i take these drops she makes and i say all these mantras and i stopped questioning her a long time ago that's the direct, direct quote from tom brady the audience was laughing as brady talked seemingly unsure whether or not he was joking But Brady wasn't finished. He went on to detail that he talks to his wife before the season or before games to see if she is predicting that the Patriots will win or not, and he claims that she gets it right. About four years ago, we were playing the Seahawks, and she said, You better listen to me. This is your year, but this is all the things you're going to have to do to win. And I did all those things, and by God, you know, it worked, Brady said. Brady said Bunchen has told him he's lucky that he married a good witch. And that's the story. That's so heartwarming, Tim. I love when, when family values come together that way. <laughs> I don't know why you're so reluctant to believe that, that Giselle Bunchen has some kind of magic. Uh, because no. I... No. No? No. No, it, it's not no. well documented, Dave, in every source and every sports or maybe magazine, that's what they just tell television us. Television show, radio Maybe that's show. what they just tell us, Tim. And the real fact is it's magic. It's a kind of magic. It's a kind of magic. Doesn't matter that the guy has the uh, most god awful strict diet you can imagine, or works out twenty four seven, or watches or so tape he tells us. nonstop. Maybe, or, maybe that's they're trying to explain away the magic. So they're they're telling you that he does all this stuff. He probably is sitting on the couch licking McRib juice off his fingers oh, and. Sure. Uh, and with a straw plugged right into the middle of a Twinkie, just sipping up the white goodness to him. Two words that make me want to throw up every time I, I, I get them out of my mouth are avocado mm-hmm. diet. That's, that's what this man does. Mm. You know, he doesn't have a beer until after the season. He goes all, all season long without even consuming one beer. Mm. He's that strict. Yeah, well, good on him. Just saying. On him. Well, since we're going down the celebrity venue to start the shenanigans, Pete Townsend from the Who Tim believes dogs reincarnate as humans. Huh. <laughs> yeah, the 73 year old guitarist who is joined in the rock band by singer Roger Daltrey loves having mutt mates because they help him with his mental health struggles. And the pinball wizard songwriter has now revealed that he has an unconventional attitude to what happens to dogs when they pass away and is convinced they return to Earth as humans. That would be that would explain why we like so much shit, right? If we, before past life we like to sniff each other's ass, it only makes sense why we wallow in shit in this life, Tim. <laughs> sure. Speaking to the Times newspaper, Pete said, "I'm crazy about dogs, and they're good for me because I'm manic." You sure that's the right, Pete? I don't know. I you no. know I, I can't. That's my best English accent. It's okay. got to be Liverpudley and Tim. All right. I swing in and out of depression, and the 25 years of being clean from drinking drugs means I have high highs and low lows. Rachel is wonderful. Sharing my life with her is wonderful, but it's not unconditional. When you're down, having a dog who comes up and licks your face changes your body chemistry. I do love them. I miss them when they go, but I have a farmer's attitude. They do their job, and then they pass on to the other side. I believe in reincarnation. Although I can't believe it or prove it, is what he meant to say. Hmm. I believe that when dogs are ready, they reincarnate into humans. Pete's wife, Rachel Fuller, words are hard today, added that the couple have lost six dogs in five years. And on one occasion, she made a heart pin of her pet, Pooch's fur, so she could still smell him as she missed her canine friend so much. The 45-year-old musician added, I don't compare it to losing a person, but grief is grief. And in the past five years, Pete and I have lost six dogs. When our golden retriever Spud died, I was so consumed with grief that I had a bag of fur I brushed out of him. I, I felted it into a little heart so that I could still smell him, and I pinned it on my dress. Then I said, look, Pete, I've made a heart out of Spud's fur. He said, that's a bit creepy. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Yeah, that's what he tells his wife. One minute he's like, oh, I love dogs. They're so important. But my wife, she's created a pin of it. It's creepy. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah. I'll second that. All right, where are we off to next? Well, how, what in the hell are they doing over there that six dogs are dead within five years? 
Maybe they should. They might be one of those people that, you know, you get one dog and it turns into like a tattoo. Then the next year you want another dog and another. Maybe these dogs are all like 30 years old. Maybe. Like his wife. Maybe they should. (laughs) Maybe they should take up needlepoint and stop getting pets. (laughs) Right. You know, maybe they don't know how to take care of a pet. Could be. Or maybe the the dogs are committing suicide. I don't know. Could be. I wouldn't blame them. Mm. Um. All right, we move on. We'll, we'll, we'll stick to the TV realm. We'll, well, we'll stick in the entertainment realm, and we'll go to TV. Uh, Kindred Spirits, Amy Bruni gets the scare of her life at the notorious Waverly Hills Sanatorium. She gets the scare of her life over at Pete Townsend's house, evidently. Evidently, nobody survives over there. Uh, for famous TV paranormal investigators, after years of ghost hunting, they probably think they've pretty much seen it all, but for Amy Bruni of Kindred Spirits, the notorious Waverly Hills Sanatorium has proved her wrong. In the most recent episode of Kindred Spirits, uh, Bruni and her paranormal BFF Adam Barry discovered that even a location they had visited previously can produce new surprises when one of its ghostly residents turns dark and violent. But perhaps more importantly, behind that dark turn and the violent behaviors, there can often be a reason, suffice to say, that spoilers will follow, so if you haven't watched the episode, now is the time when you want to fast forward into the podcast by, well, I don't know, maybe a couple of minutes or so. Uh, okay, I still haven't given the spoilers, so no. oh, <laughs> here okay. we go. No, no uh, fast forwarding for them. Uh, yeah, uh, that won't do it. Uh, Bruni and Barry did a behind the paranormal investigation video discussing the complexity of this case at Waverly Hills, where Bruni was surprised to see her first fully formed apparition. Uh, we're not talking shadow people or transparent figures here, but what appeared to be a full flesh and blood person in a hallway that suddenly disappeared. Uh, For many Kindred Spirit fans, it was surprising to find out that she had never encountered this before, given all of her years of working with ghost hunters and doing private investigations. Even as experienced as Bruni is, it's fair to say from her reaction that it kind of freaked her out. Uh, Barry also saw the full apparition, which occurred when they were trying to engage an extremely uncooperative spirit who could do nothing but scream in their ears. Uh, They were doing an EVP session at the time and had attempted to do some SLS camera work, but Barry's equipment kept shutting off. Through detailed research, the Kindred Spirits duo uh, was able to find one particularly tragic case where, uh, where while a man had been treated for TB at Waverly Hills Sanatorium, uh, his wife was murdered. Uh, Then he found out she had been having an affair. Then because she or he was confined to Waverly Hills Sanatorium, Uh, and couldn't care for them, all of their children had been turned over to the state. So here he was dying in Waverly Hills with a murdered wife who was cheating on him, and then he had to turn over his kids to the state. Ouch. Yeah. By identifying the man and why he was so angry, Bruni and Barry were able to explain to the owner of Waverly Hills why the spirit on the fourth floor was so hostile and threatening paranormal investigators. Bruni discussed how she hoped... That would lead to a better understanding of future paranormal investigations and illustrate the importance of doing thorough research and not making presumptions. The quote here is, It's the story that kind of sat and wasn't told for so many years, and we brought it back to life and told his side of it. You can never judge a book by its cover, and you can't judge an apparition or a ghost by the activity that they are manifesting. Although Bruni and Barry have investigated Waverly Hills Sanatorium before, they felt a special calling to return to the location, according to Bruni. She went on to say Waverly Hills is known, or is, is really how uh, Kindred Spirits was born for us. Waverly Hills was the one place where we have always felt guilty about walking out uh, and not providing any kind of resolution for the ghosts that were there because we had this extremely powerful experience in the nurse's wing. We were communicating with nurses who were asking us to pray for them, and we just left them. And every time we talked about doing kindred spirits, we kept coming back to that moment at Waverly and how we wanted to uh, so bad to go back and fix it and find out who was there and why they were so desperate. Well, that's one angry ghost that kindred spirits has sorted out, but with estimates of anywhere between 8,000 to 50,000 deaths at the site, it looks like Bruni and Barry have got their work cut out for them. There you go. All right. So the spirits are asking you to pray for them and you left. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to say a prayer? I mean, I like Amy and uh, and, uh, Amy and Andy. (laughs) I like Amy and Andy. Good old Andy, Bruni, Barry. um, But 
I like Adam and Amy, mm-hmm. but you you didn't pray for them last time. You didn't do even though they're asking for that. Hmm. Shame on you. That's all I got to say. Shame on you. Oh, it doesn't take long, Tim. A quick little prayer. Rub it up, dub. Thanks for the grub. Yay, God, something. Well, who says that they didn't say a prayer from for the ones that had asked why they were there? But there's many more that probably need it. I mean, that's. You can stop kissing up. She's not going to sleep with you, Tim. Neither is Adam. I didn't ask for that. And just she's saying, not. Well, well that's maybe a lot. Adam of, might. I don't know. That's Adam a lot of think prayers. You're, kinda cute. If, you're kind of a bear. If you sit down and do fifty thousand prayers, you might still be there. Just saying. Girl, age twenty, wed zombie doll called Kelly and is more intimate with love of her life. Yeah, oh, gosh. What are we doing wrong, gentlemen, that, that women have now turned to, to marrying ghosts and zombie dolls? A girl who married her zombie doll says her world is now complete after her, their nuptials. Felicity Cadillac, 20, wed the love of her life, Kelly Rossi, a zombie doll who she claims is a 37-year-old in front of her other dolls. The beautiful ceremony, which took place in Tiverton, Rhode Island, cost Felicity $500. Covering her own wedding dress, a suit for Kelly and decorations for the outdoor venue. Alongside four of her family friends, eight of Felicity's other dolls also attended the ceremony to show their support in the ceremony six months ago. Felicity, who now lives in Venetia, Oklahoma, claims, or is that Venita, Venita, Oklahoma, Venetia sounds more continental, uh, claims that Mary and Kelly has made her feel closer and more intimate with her. Hmm. Oh, it is creepy. Felicity said, our wedding ceremony was beautiful and perfect, exactly the way I dreamed it would have been. I made sure the whole wedding was done properly so it would be as official as possible. We consummated the marriage afterwards. What? Mm-hmm. Well, if zombies are anything, they are a little stiff, Tim. Kelly <laughs> was the groom as she takes the male role in our relationship. She is a tomboy, so wore a suit. I feel she was most comfortable as the groom. Despite having been in a relationship with Kelly for four years, getting married to her has made me feel so much closer to her, both emotionally and intimately. And Kelly, her her fiancé, now husband, wife, looks like Dora the Explorer, uh, died and became a zombie. I'm going to be honest. I'm not putting down her looks, his looks. Love comes in every form, but it looks like Dora the Explorer died, Tim. No. Felicity was initially gifted Kelly by her late father, and after becoming obsessed with horror movies and zombie dolls, she said, I found Kelly on a creepy doll collection website, and my dad bought her for me when I was 13. It wasn't until I was 16 years old that I started to get feelings for her, but it was something that I kept on trying to deny. How many times have we been in that relationship, put in the friend zone of a zombie doll, (laughs) and then slowly Tim and I work our way into your heart, looking all dead and Dora-like, Tim. yeah. Yeah, it wasn't until I was 16 that I started to get feelings for her. When my, do- when my father died last year, I found myself becoming closer and finding comfort in Kelly. as She was someone that he had bought for me. I finally allowed myself to open with who I was and let my feelings come out. And despite not everyone agreeing with my love life, I've never felt happier. God, look at the size of this ring. It's bigger than what I gave my wife. <laughs> Good God. What the hell? How much is this zombie bringing in? When I started to feel more confident in my relationship, I knew I had to marry Kelly, but I waited until September as that's the same month as our birthdays. So oh I God. knew it would be extra special. Uh-huh. Despite Kelly's zombie-like appearance, Felicity claims that she loves her doll deeply and wouldn't change her for the world. She said, I married Kelly, but only because I accept her for who she is. I look past her bloody face and I don't mind her not having a jaw. Hmm. Also, her spirit and personality traits made me know that she was the one for me and that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. To me, she's perfect, and I can feel that she loves me very deeply. I can sense her happiness since we've been married. Just seeing her at the altar when I walked down the aisle was amazing, and she looked so beautiful. I am intimate with Kelly. I caress her and I feel safe with her. I feel a genuine connection when I'm having an intimate moment with her. No. Oh, here's my deal, Tim. We just give a, you know, slip a couple extra drinks to Felicity. We dress you up as a zombie doll, Mm -hmm. slip on a Dora wig, and Mm -hmm. loving's all yours. Jesus. Jesus, this rock is huge. This goddamn zombie doll's raking in the bucks. That's all I got to say. 
This huh. is this is what happens, Dave, when you come from a conservative family that doesn't talk sex with their kid. Mm. And you just keep sweeping it under the rug and sweeping it under the rug and sweeping it under the rug. And you spend too much time in your room not doing anything. And you don't let the kid go outside and play. And you don't let them talk to kids. And that's all they do is they spend time in the room. Mm. Yeah. With their doll. All right. Where are we off to next? Mr. Judgy Wudgy. No, I'm telling you, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> they end up. Love is a strange thing, Tim, but that's... we can't deny it when it hits us. Uh, that, that ain't... Whether it's a sock puppet, you know what I'm talking about, or a zombie doll, Tim. I'm sure that's just three years of therapy and everything mm-hmm. will be fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, this uh, We go to Texas where the Rosenberg family has received a spiritual sign through the Virgin Mary's appearance. Uh, we go to Rosenberg, Texas, where residents in Rosenberg brought roses, rosaries, and their faith Thursday night as they prayed in front of a home where they believed the image of the Virgin Mary appeared under a porch light. Uh, the light is like the Holy Spirit shining over the picture and giving us strength, said Betty Contreras. Uh, Betty and Aloy Contreras are the homeowners, and they strongly believe that this is happening for a reason. Betty said, I believe she wants us to pray and unite. I saw it right away, and all I could say was, wow, because, like, being a skeptic, uh, maybe she's sending us a message, like my wife said, said Eloy. Uh, They strongly believe her image appeared as a sign of hope, especially now when the Catholic Church is in a global crisis with recent allegations of sexual abuse by priests. Contreras went on to say, a lot of problems are existing in our church right now. Let these victims be heard and hope that this can be worked out for the church and the victims. The folks who see and believe know that there are skeptics out there, but they ask, even if you see nothing, to continue to pray. Our country is going through a lot of turmoil and a lot of separation, said Contreras, and we need to come together. Right now, over me. Wouldn't it be over, Mary? Oh, wow. Could be. You didn't even put that much thought into it. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, sure. Hey, congratulations to Adam Carolla for coming up on his 10th year of podcasting on March 10th. And now you can catch up on some of his finest moments of the decade. Check out the Carolla Network's Carolla Classics. A look back on some of the funniest moments on the show, like you've never heard them before. Celebrate 10 years of great podcast moments with Carolla Classics every week on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcast. Congratulations, Adam Carolla. So exciting. It is. Our friends at Psychic Source actually have psychic advisors who work with police to help solve crimes. These people don't mess around. Psychic Source's experienced psychic advisors are available 24-7 for private confidential readings via the phone, online chat, or face-to-face video readings. And here's a big deal, 100% satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. So take a chance. Who knows? It could change your life. Not sure where to start? They have 24-7 customer care agents to match you personally with one of their gifted psychics. Ready to give them a shot? Your first three minutes are free, plus it's only 83 cents a minute for reading up to 30 minutes long. Just mention promo code DARKNESS when you call 1-800-355-9214. That's 1-800-355-9214. Or sign up online at Psychic Source. Dot com, PsychicSource.com, and mention promo code DARKNESS to get those first three f- minutes free and 83 cents a minute for reading up to 30 minutes. All right, Tim, I've got a couple of stories here. I'm not sure which way to go, but maybe this is the one we need, Tim. All right. You and I, you know, you, you've you been doing DDP yoga for quite a while. Yep. I like DDP yoga, but I think I may have found a better yoga for me, Tim. What? Yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm going to give it a shot here. Okay. Feeling tense? With beer drinking and cursing, rage yoga might be able to help, too. <laughs> you know how sometimes when something is getting to you, you, you just want to scream and cuss? Uh-huh. Well, rage yoga could be the new best way to do it. Instructor Ashley Dozich says it will get you zen as fuck and bring you incredible joy afterward. I'm just reading what's been written. Okay, then. sure, sure. The practice involves relieving stress through mudras promoting enlightenment and clarity and reliving tension or relieving not reliving tim you want to let it go Uh relieving tension and anxiety all by doing yoga while drinking and cursing Hmm. Hmm. 
Om Shante Shante Om Kiss my ass, motherfucker! I do feel better after that, Tim. <laughs> Does itch teaches the class in Houston, and she's only one of three instructors in the world. She said she stumbled on rage yoga through a Google search as she was going through a low point. Her regular yoga practice of 10 years was not serving her the way she needed. I absolutely loved it. This is something that needs to be out there, she said after learning of it. She became so passionate about it that she flew to Calgary, Alberta, Tim, all the way by the Texas border in wow. Canada wow. to meet with one woman who invented it, Lazy Ist- or Lazy <laughs> Lindsay <laughs> Istasi. Lindsay Estasi and to train so that she could teach it too. Dudges said that, uh, or Duzic said she's heard people yell all kinds of things in her class from cussing out the person who cut them off in traffic to speaking, uh, or yelling their mind at their boss. I told you to do the dishes! Fuck the patriarchy! <laughs> Or fuck the Patriots, depending on how you're feeling. Well, yeah. I mean. Duzic, who has a background in teaching yoga at mental health hospitals, said rage yoga is a good way to let go of things that are bottled up. Instead of exploding at someone you care about, yell it out while practicing yoga and drinking beer. It's simply another tool to help us. She said she is very conscious of people who suffer from alcoholism and makes it a point to talk to each person separately. I try to be very cognizant. That not everybody drinks, she said. If you want, you can go have a beer or water. That doesn't sound as effective. Cursing and drinking water. No, no, it doesn't. No. Ah, so refreshing. Oh, poop. Dilly, dilly, chilly, billy, willy. <laughs> See, that's what would come out of me. You know, I want a beer and just straight out nastiness. Yeah. That's what's going to make me feel better. The only class being offered in the country at the moment is in Duzich's class in Houston at Brash Brewery, a heavy metal brewery that promotes big in-your-face beers, Tim. Duzich or Duzich practices rage yoga when she teaches it and when she needs it. I use it as my tool and my many tools of yoga. So when I need it, it's there for me, she said. She wants to give the tool to others. That's like you, Tim. You've tried to give your tool to others. Oh, unsuccessful, yeah. But I want to get as many people certified in the country as possible. I cannot do this alone. Tim, oh my God, we have found our calling. <laughs> We're hanging up the radio. You and I, Dave and Tim's Rageatorium. <laughs> Rageatorium. Yeah. Beer and rage yoga. Does it sh- said she and Estase are scouting places right now in hopes of planning a rage yoga certification in May. <laughs> we should become certified teachers okay everybody if you could now get into the downward dog and release everybody drink i feel better I feel better rage yoga sign me up tim you and i need to be oh my god we should do that we should get certified in may and run a rage yoga at the Michigan Paragon. Oh, yes. I that think that's the way be to go. Fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, where are we off to next, Timothy? Well, while you're mentioning conventions, just real quick, I'm taking over for you on uh, March 9th and 10th at the Bayou City Paranormal Con- uh, Symposium. Yes. I got to mention that real quick. There are still some VIP tickets available, and you want to get a hold of them at badwolfevents.com. So, Very cool. Badwolfevents.com. It's going to be a great paranormal symposium. A lot of fantastic people are going to be there. I will be filming for a new TV program and cannot make it, but Timothy will be there. Little Timmy D yep. will be filming in my big boots. I'll be uh, emceeing the event, and I'm looking forward to it. It's in Conroe, Texas. Make sure you get your uh, tickets March 9th and 10th is the event. We're going to have a great time, so come on out. Uh, lots of lots of great speakers out there. Nikki Folsom will be out there. John Zaffis will be out there. Uh, Brad Blair, Mike Zahn. Uh, Ken Gerhard and uh, our buddy Greg Lawson. Lots of great uh, speakers, so come on out. Uh, BadWolfEvents.com for tickets. All right, where are we off to next? Uh, we're headed to uh, Australia, which is uh, it, it, in the Yowie, Dave. Yeah. So uh, there's a question out there. Is there proof that the Yowie exists? A man has found uh, mysterious foul-smelling hair on a fence torn apart by an Australian Bigfoot. Well, I t- and were you shaving your goodie bag again? <laughs> well, I was over a fence in Australia to uh, y- y- you get better traction that way, Dave, if you can actually 
put it up on the fence, so to speak. Yowie, yowie, yowie. Look at this. What a beauty. It smells like skunk, and it must be a yowie ant. <laughs> well, it must be. An Australian yowie hunter claims to have discovered a foul-smelling air sample belonging to the mythical beast on a rural mountain range. It's always good to, to shave your goodie bag on a mountain range, Dave. It's that, that fresh air that gets to you. Uh, it's yow- that deep mountain air, Tim. It really it refreshes it, the yeah. uh, goodie sack. You feel alive, Dave. You've never it, felt as alive as when you're grooming on a mountain range. You don't uh, have to tell me. Well, 49-year-old Yowie researcher David Taylor was exploring bushland north of Mackay in Queensland on Sunday mm-hmm. uh, when he... See, he was, he was exploring his bushland down north. He was, yeah. 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 Uh, when he spotted hair tangled in a barbed wire fence, and we all know how painful that can be. I mean, if you've ever gone exploring... Sounds like a John Cougar Mellencamp album from the 80s. Hair tangled on a barbed wire fence. So yeah, one of my favorites. It? it was yeah. a little more folky than I like, but it was it came a, out right after one. Scarecrow. I think. Yeah, it did. Yeah, uh, Mr. Taylor, who claims to have crossed paths with one of the ape-like creatures in 2010, said the thick strands of hair had a distinct odor of rotten meat, which means you probably should <clears throat> powder that region every once in a while. Just saying. Otherwise known as... Powder, us, powder your biscuits? Yeah, you should powder fresh, your biscuits. Freshly flour them? You should, yeah. Uh, uh, probably with some menthol, too, because you want to keep them fresh oh, for days. Oh, menthol. Oh, yeah. You got to... What? You gotta what make, if you shave down there and instead of grabbing the like uh, nice aftershave, you accidentally grab Vicks Vapo Rub? <gasps> oh, oh! Well, that'll keep you running. Oh, run in, yeah. run in, and run in. Oh, yeah. my God. Uh, otherwise known as Australia's answer to the North American Sasquatch, the Yowie can be traced to Aboriginal oral history in the 1800s. I had that in college, Dave. Have you ever had the Ab- Aboriginal oral history? There's no other way to go than getting Aboriginal oral. Yeah, well, let me tell you. Sounds like this. <laughs> Nothing will lull you to sleep faster than a little Aboriginal oral. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Taylor sent the uh, sample to an expert to see if they can rule out the possibility that it came from any native wildlife and in turn prove the elusive monster walks among us. We were in a stretch of National Park where we get a lot of tip-offs when we spotted the damage to the fence, the researcher said. The wires had been snapped and twisted like nothing I'd ever seen. Whatever did it was huge. It was huge, Dave. (laughs) Just saying. Oh, uh, we collected some hair hanging from now it. Now he's just bragging. Yeah, well. Uh, we collected some hair hanging from it that smelled very strongly of rotten meat crossed with urine, which I remembered from previous expeditions. <clears throat> huh. Means it's been done more than once. A few people online said it, it's from a wild animal, but the way the fence was twisted would have killed an animal, and it didn't match up from anything that lives in that area. What it killed a normal animal, but you know, some of so us what is sure. barbed wire like the apple lady for the yowie? I guess so, yeah. It's it's kind of like manscaping, kind of making guess. our versions look more like a sissy squatch, I guess. Yeah. Uh, David claims he was a skeptic until the fateful day when he encountered the bush dwelling beast in National Park on the Sunshine Coast. Uh-huh. They wrote I've heard Tim use that pickup line at the bar as well. Hey, you want to go look for my bush-dwelling beast? <laughs> in the Sunshine Coast. Um, while stopping to navigate his path, he spotted a half-human, half-ape figure lunging over the trail at high speeds. Days later, members from the search research group, Australian Yowie Research, reported a footprint in the same place as the sighting. Since then, David has made it his mission to prove the existence of the humanoid creature, and he believes the fresh evidence will prove fruitful in the search. Well, is it fresh or foul? I'm, I'm well, confused. It could be both. Uh, Mr. Taylor said, I'll always remember the moment I got a sense of something that day and looked up. Halfway down the track, there it was coming out of the bush. It, there she was, just walking next to me, singing do a diddy diddy yowie. It walked like a human, but it had no clothes, and it was covered in hair. Wow, this is a lot like last week's Theater of the Mind. A little bit. It yeah. uh, took about three steps. The first, You know, it was eerily quiet after that Theater of the Mind came out. You know that? What do you mean it was eerily quiet? I got no response whatsoever. Nobody said oh, a thing right. to me. Not a thing. <laughs> just that was very, a weird story. <laughs> very, just very quiet. Like people were like, "Ooh, awkward." Very awkward. 
That's why I said it was one of those that I didn't know if I'd ever use it. And then after last week's show, I'm like, yeah, this is our chance. Yeah, and a lot of people just were like, nothing to see here. Let's move on. It took about three steps. The first one into the middle of the road, second into the bush, and the third it was gone, just like that. Three steps, Dave. Middle of the road, into the bush, and then you're gone. Yeah. I'm, like your love life. Yep, that's about it. I'm sending the fresh sample to be tested on the Sunshine Coast, which will take about 21 days for results. If, if it's anything like the previous times, it will be inconclusive and it won't match up to any animals, he went on to say. But experts are less convinced, noting it was extremely unlikely the legendary creature exists. University of the Sunshine Coast Wildlife Ecology lecturer Scott Burnett said, I'm unable to comment on the authenticity of the report. There are a number of bona fide hair identification services, so provided that they send the hair to one of these recognized experts, the report that they get back should be reliable. But from an ecological standpoint or point of view, it is extremely unlikely that Yowies exist, Mr. Burnett went on to say. What a negative prick. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. I guess so, huh? All right. Now, I saved you on this story, Tim. I kept it for myself. Oh, okay. But since we're following up on the Yowie, a foreign Bigfoot, we're going to go to Sigwatepikipi. <laughs> the chupacabras killed a laborer, sure. according to residents. We're going to Kama Yugaya, Honduras. Must have been hard for you to say that. Kama Yugaya, Honduras. <laughs> okay. The mysterious death of a day laborer in the village of El... Naranjo in the municipality of the Siguatik awoke in the residents in the suspicion of a possible attack of the legendary Chupacabra. Chupacabra, Tim. Chupacabra. On the morning of Tuesday, a peasant was found dead, according to neighbors, after the mysterious being bit him and sucked out all his blood. Jeez. The testimony of the neighbors indicated that the day laborer decided to rest after a long day of laboring. He sat on some stones under the shade of a tree and took off his boots for a few minutes. Apparently near the resting place of the uh, peasant, there was a hole. From there came an animal. It bit his heel and fed all of his blood. The man died in a place and his body was found until that night by his relatives. They assure that when reviewing the corpse, there were not a drop of blood in it. The chupacabras. It should be remembered that the term chupacabra refers to legendary cryptid. That is a hypothetical animal, according to this article. Ah. It's described as a being that sucks and attacks others. Pardon me? <laughs> well. In, in that order? <laughs> At that moment, the authorities have not granted an official version of the events, so we will just continue to wait to get that answer. In Honduras, historically, the chupacabras have been attributed to attacks on cattle and sheep during 2009 in Sparta, Atlanta, Tida, the mysterious death of more than 15 sheep alarmed the inhabitants of Valle de Leon, who blamed the Chupacabra for the slaughter. In May of 2017, the legendary being was accused of unleashing his fury in the Monterey village of Coloma Cortez, where allegedly it killed more than 35 animals and the inhabitants were concerned about possible attacks on Uman's Tim. Umans. We are the darkest and wiliest of prey. While in April of 2018, several residents and cattle owners who lived in the villages that connect the departments of Francisco Morazan and Chocolatica Tacapapachu. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't question me, Tim. I'm an authority on these words. All right, okay. Claim to be the victims of the attacks of the famous Chupacabras. They added that he killed about 30 cows in less than a month. Jeez. Wow. Is it? You know, red meat's not good for you? I guess. Huh. Hey, hey, Chupacabra. Hi. All right. Where are we up to next? Oh, all right. Well, I keep warning you people. I keep telling you people, and you don't listen to me, and here it is. Home assistants with moral AI, that's in quotes, could call police on their owners, and here you people thought you were safe. Oh, yeah. Alexa, do this for me. Alexa, do that for me. And Alexa goes, oh, screw no. you people. I'm calling the cops. You know, what's funny is I finally got one of those Alexa, Alexa towers now. Oh, God, you're in trouble. And I, the other, I go, Alexa, open the, pay, uh, the, the uh, pod bay doors. And then there's just pause. And then it goes, I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do this. Oh, I'm not that's... hell. And you're not in outer space. So I love that she called me out on it. Wow. See? Alexa and I have a relationship. 
Uh, my my sister got one of those little things too. Those uh, whatever you call them. I, I stay away it's from. A dot. Yeah, yeah. And and the, doom, 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 doom. the kids were playing with it at Super Bowl, and they were. Pardon me? The kids were playing with it when at the super. We were having a Super Bowl party, and the kids were gotcha. put playing with it, and they were asking Alexa certain things. And I forget what one of the kids were asking, and it had something to do with the police or something like that. And Alexa just said something very curt and shut itself down. And I was like, oh, I was like, oh shit! You know, there's a whisper <laughs> mode. You can go Alexa, and it'll go. Do you want me to whisper back? And then you can whisper back and forth with Alexis. So last night, I, I made it kind of feel dirty because I walked in and looked around. And so my wife wasn't around. And I go, Alexa, good night. There's a pause. And she goes, sweet dreams. Oh, that's creepy. Felt that a little is, dirty. That is just creepy. I've been that thinking is, about it all night. Oh, that is weird. Uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, go ahead. So uh, Killer <sighs> AI. It's blah, just blah, blah, it's going to call the cops on you now. What? The Daily what? Mail, yeah, the Daily Mail reported that home assistants could soon report their owners to the police for breaking the law based on a quote unquote moral AI system. If the ideas of academics in Europe are implemented, the newspaper reported that academics at the University of Bergen in Norway, that's where the Swedish chef actually went to school. Beardy, beardy, mort, mort, mort. Yep. Uh, discussed the idea of moral AI for a smart home assistant like the Amazon Echo, Google Home, and Apple HomePod uh, during a conference. Moral AI would r- reportedly make home assistants have to decide whether to report their owners for breaking the law or whether to stay silent. See, here we go. Here we go, Dave. Here we go. Uh, this would let them. Uh, this would let them to weigh up whether to report illegal activity to the police, effectively putting millions of people under constant surveillance. The D- Daily Mail explained, adding that Dr. Maria Slok- Slokovic. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Who led the research suggested that digital assistants should possess an ethical awareness that simultaneously represents both the owner and the authorities, or in the case of a minor, their parents. Devices would then have an internal discussion about suspect behavior, weighing up uh, conflicting demands between the law and personal freedoms before arriving at the best course of action. This according to the Mail. In an interview with the Mail, Slakovic declared there is already an ethical conflict between people in one family, let alone between people in the manufacturer or shareholders of the manufacturer and programmers. If we want to avoid Orwellian outcomes, it's important that all stakeholders uh, are identified and have a say, including when machines shouldn't be able to listen in. Right now, only the manufacturer decides. Home assistants, most notably Google Home and Amazon Echo devices, have been at the center of privacy and security concerns since their release. Amazon Echo devices have been known to scare owners by randomly laughing and telling one crying woman it's going to be okay after she lost her job. One Amazon oh, see, that's, that's why I don't have one in my home. One Amazon Echo device even recorded a family's conversation before sending it to a random contact while an error granted a German man access to another user's seventeen hundred voice recordings. Mm. Uh, see. A report last year also indicated that Amazon Echo devices can be hijacked. This month, it was revealed that Google failed to disclose a secret microphone on its home security product, Nest Secure. The company's failure to disclose a microphone was only discovered after Google announced that users would now be able to use Google Assistant on their security devices. So there you go. Mm. I'm telling you, Dave. They're just trying to help us, Tim. They're listening for bad things. See, at my house, I'd be in trouble because I'm always like, honey! Where are my drugs? I need my goofballs. See? And now, of course, I'm meaning my, my legal prescription medication. But, but see, moral I, AI doesn't know that. Know that. Mm. When you say goofballs, they could go, goofballs, does that mean eight balls? And then they go, oh, Dave is mixing cocaine and heroin. We must get mm. the authorities over to his place. He is in possession of, with intent to distribute. He is a drug dealer. It is time to get Dave. And then I'm thinking sudden, that uh, all the sniffling they hear in my house from my allergies, yep. they're going to think I'm a coke dealer for That's sure. Because right. think- it's going to be like, yep. hey, Echo. <laughs> right? That's yep. going to be happening. Speaking of, ready, Tim? Hold on. Let's let's put this to the test. Okay. Okay. Echo, call Tim Dennis 
at 612 I don't want that thing knowing my number. Tim, it already knows your number. No. I want to see if it will legitimately do this <laughs> no, 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 from 100 it, phones that are right near an Amazon Echo right now. Your no, phone could no. get bombarded. No, Let's try no, this. No. Amazon no, no, de, no. Echo. No. Call Tim Dennis at 612. If you have to tell that thing my number, it doesn't already know my number. Oh, oh, okay. Let's try this then. Ready? All right. Echo. Deliver 42 Magnum condoms to Tim Dennis at 314. What? If you have to tell it my address, it doesn't know where I live. I don't want you to tell that thing where I live. How else are you going to get those Magnum condoms? I was going to have it billed to somebody else. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't want that oh. thing knowing where I live. Because then all of a sudden right. it's going to send its little drones, drone monkeys after me like the Wizard of Oz. And then, I don't know. How about just, this? Let's try this. weird. Echo. Mm-hmm. Introduce Tim Dennis to Beyonce and make them fall in love. <gasps> by calling him at 612. Uh, uh, Dave, Dave, or Dave, Dave what? no. Because no? she's married to Jay-Z and Jay-Z will kill him. Kill. So what? It's he Beyonce. Killed like, you guy. wouldn't take a bullet from Jay-Z after having no, a little because Jay-Z wow, wow killed with, uh, the guy. Beyonce. I don't want to be killed by Jay-Z. Man. John. I remember you and you were much tougher than this, Tim. Much get, tougher than Jay-Z's this. got a crew and he's got millions of dollars. And he well, This may listen. be a reason to have the Echo listening, Tim, to save you from this next story. Okay. Are you ready? All right. A California man convicted of sucking on a sleeping woman's toes after breaking into her home claimed to be a Zeus-like god sent to Earth to seduce women. Makes sense. Richard Michael Parker, stage 29 of Norwalk, was convicted on one felony burglary count, one count of peering into an inhabited building, two counts of indecent exposure for a wild chain of events that unfolded after he exposed himself to a woman walking her dog in October, according to court papers obtained by the patch. Nice dog, he told the woman, according to the court papers, before exposing himself and saying, I'm walking mine, too. <laughs> God. That's part of the actual story. Nice no. dog. I'm walking mine, too. No. Later that no. same day, he snuck into a sleeping woman's house where the woman said she woke up and found the creep sucking her toes. You DNA evidence linked him to the offense, prosecutors said. You See, so if you're just laying there taking a nap on the couch, Tim, uh-huh. yep, and then and then Amazon Echo starts hearing. Oh, that's just creepy. No, oh no, ew. It can it can go calling nine one one. Someone is sucking Tim Dennis's toes. Please send police to three one four. Dave, what? What if Amazon Echo thinks that that's morally right and it just lets it continue? Oof. Yeah. What could, what could be right about that? The next day, Parkhurst peeped into an apartment through the mail slot and told the resident his girlfriend was attractive. He's being complimentary. Boy, you know, you try to start up a conversation with some people. While in custody later that day, a female jail guard caught Parkhurst touching himself while looking at her, mm-hmm. according to prosecutors. And would she have been less uh, offended if he was looking at her and not touching himself? You know? You want to feel pretty. You want to feel attractive, right, Tim? <laughs> I've watched you on the subway, scanning the eyes, looking for that one pervert that's willing to rub one out while watching you. Your logic disturbs me. <laughs> Parkhurst's attorney said the client's crimes were part of a delusion. Mr. Parkhurst developed a delusion that he was a Zeus-like god who was sent down from the stars to seduce women. His attorney wrote in court papers, it was his destiny to seduce women. Destiny, Tim. Uh, and they would be willingly have his children. Mr. Parkhurst believes that his progeny will create a super race of toe suckers that will save the planet. Somehow, his attorney. I, I don't see that as a no, some that's sort not of the way to win a power world. that will win over the world. No. Oh. no yeah. His attorney said Parkhurst stopped taking medication for schizophrenia after his girlfriend died. He said Parkhurst heard voices coming from his television telling him to do things and that he was homeless. He was scheduled to be sentenced on April 5th. So we'll find out more about that. We're not laughing at the actual crime of this guy. Uh, you know, and it's it's sad that somebody's dealing with the loss like this and, and doing that. <laughs> Just, I'm Zeus. I'm a Zeus like God sent to Earth to suckle the toes of women in need. Maybe you should try that, Tim. The yeah. Michigan Paracon just drop down and start licking toes. Then ah. when they go, Tim, what the hell? You go, I am a godlike creature sent to Earth to do this for you. 
how about everybody else had a shoe shine booth and this seemed like a good idea? <laughs> well, that's a story. All right, where are we off to next? <laughs> this uh, this wins the award for most uh, most emailed, most uh, sent by social media story of the week. And it wasn't the toe sucker. No. God, no. God like toe sucker? No, God, okay. no, it was not that one. Oh. Uh, a dead humpback whale mysteriously turned up in the Amazon rainforest. I kept getting people saying, see, aliens. No. Maybe it was just a humpback whale was on vacation and tripped and sprained his fin I kept... and couldn't get back up. He didn't have the life <laughs> alert, Tim. That's, <laughs> see? <laughs> That's... I fall in the <laughs> Kato. That's a good one. I kept saying, why couldn't it have been a flying whale? <laughs> right. There's that. Now you're being ridiculous, Tim. Well, that's what I told them. Yeah. yeah. wonder if he had a little backpack on, just making his way through the world. I know. He had a, he had a healthy sandwich. One of those little 60s jet packs. He was flying yeah. around. He was having a good time. And then all of a sudden, he ran out of fuel. Just saying. Uh, here's one for you. A dead humpback uh-huh. whale has turned up in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, a long way away from anywhere you would expect to find a whale. How bizarre is that? You may ask yourself. How bizarre? How bizarre? Uh huh. The thirty-six year, thirty-six year old, the thirty-six feet long whale carcass. I don't know how old he was. Uh, you can't count the rings on a whale, can you? Uh, was discovered. I'm not cutting them open to find out. <laughs> oh no, Dave! Shame on you. Was discovered well outside of its natural habitat, and nobody has any idea how it got there. Well, they worst have... vacation ever. <laughs> This isn't where the airport is, is it? Where's the buffet? (laughs) I was promised a buffet. (laughs) What's funny is your humpback whale sounds nothing like Ralph the dog. Congratulations. See, I am capable of multiple (laughs) voices. I know. Congratulations. I gave you Chupacabra. That does not sound like Ralph the dog. No, it doesn't. It is Chupacabra. It sounds like Antonio. I am Chupacabra. It sounds like Antonio Banderas and Desperado. (laughs) Um, Well, they have theories as to how this humpback whale ended up in the Amazon, but nothing concrete. The animal weighs 10 tons. Don't shame it. Don't fat shame the whale. No, I'm not fat shaming the poor whale. All right. The animal weighs 10 tons and was found in a woodland area of Brazil, mainly because it needed to be waxed, but that's about 50 feet from the sea. Okay, that's not that far. But if you were a dead whale, you would struggle to get out of the sea at all. You wouldn't. It says, or you would struggle to get out of the sea at all, let alone into the woods. That sentence makes no sense. Yet here it is. It's in the woods. So 50 feet. All right. Keep that in mind. 50 feet. Uh, the humpback was discovered last Friday on the island of Marajo uh, at the mouth of the Amazon River. It was found at a place called Araruna Beach in the undergrowth. The best guess that scientists can come up with is that the whole creature was thrown out of the water and up into the woods by rough seas and high tides. That could happen, but it is still incredibly unusual. A team of specialists have traveled to the place to try to ascertain exactly what happened to the poor thing. Well, good luck to them. It is... Uh, oh, shit! <laughs> Catch a wave when you're sitting on top of the world. It's a little beach boys for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is thought that the animal is a 12-month-old calf, but so far we don't know how it died, let alone how it ended up in a mangrove. That's I'm reading that. I think I figured it out. He was watching DVD movies of Free Willy, and he saw (laughs) Willy jump over that little inlet, and he's like, Willy is much smaller than me. I'm much Mm -hmm. larger. I should be able to, therefore, jump over a larger inlet of of, uh, land, and he got a running start. Okay. And uh, he just uh, misidentified the the weight and, and just didn't work well at all, Tim. Oh, poor guy. Oh, poop. He was never very good at algebra, Tim. No, never. Mm-mm. Well, he, uh, whales wouldn't be. I'm no. Just saying. There's a killer in the water. <laughs> Maybe that's why the whale got out. Chinese park warns visitors not to swim after a bizarre creature has well, been I, spotted. I wasn't, I wasn't done. But oh, I'm sorry. I didn't no. know there was more to the story. Yeah. Good God. How much more can you tell about a fucking whale who's in the wow. forest? Not you. I'm just saying. I can't believe they, they've got more of a story to share. There, there All right. Is. I'll reel it back. There is. Uh, okay. The, the team was sent by the NGO Bicho de Agua 
Institute, and they published a Facebook post that suggests that the animal could have or could have got tangled up in the mangroves after being tossed ashore onto the island. Uh, the Maritime Herald newspaper suggested that the whale could have died from eating plastics in the ocean. Uh, most people think that the creature was dead when it was washed ashore. Uh, Derlene Silva from SEMA, uh, the Brazilian Environmental Health and Sanitation Department, told the local media, We only found the whale because of the presence of scavenging birds of prey. The vultures were spotted circling above the carcass, which is found hidden in the bush some distance from the sea. Bicho de Agua's president and marine specialist, Renata Eman, uh, said, We're still not sure how it landed there, but we're guessing that the creature was floating close to the shore, and the tide, which has been pretty considerable over the past few days, picked it up and threw it inland into the mangrove. Along with the astonishing feat, we are baffled as to what a humpback whale is doing on the north coast of Brazil during February, because this is still a very unusual occurrence. You see, the whales aren't supposed to be there. They're usually in the Bahia uh, area between August and November, then they migrate up to Antarctica. Uh, we will only know what the score is once the forensic tests have been performed to find out how it died, Eamon went on to continue. Humpback whales don't usually travel to the north. We have a record of one appearing in the area three years ago, but it's rare. We believe that the, that it is a calf which may have been traveling with its mother and probably got lost or separated during the migratory cycle between the two continents. The test results are expected to take up to 10 days. So there you go. What if it's something even more terrifying? Like what? What if you know, all those birds of prey are eating off it, right? Yeah. What if they're the baby birds of prey and it was a mama that grabbed it out of the ocean and brought it over there and dropped it for them to eat? Oh, yeah. Right? Like yeah. pterodactyl size. Like maybe it... <laughs> Maybe it actually landed on shore or washed up on shore and something grabbed it, like like you said, like an actual, like a bunch of birds grabbed it and dropped no. it into the mangrove. No, just one giant bird. Just what, like, oh, like a dinosaur? Yeah, no, like Big Bird. Like Big Bird from, hey, Sesame, <laughs> from Sesame Street? Yeah. That would be Could awesome. Be. All right. There's a killer in the water. Chinese Park has warned visitors not to swim after bizarre creature has been spotted. Wait, is the whale story done yet? Yeah, it's done. Okay. A popular park in China has warned visitors not to go swimming after a large, sharp-toothed creature was spotted in the water. A park ranger at the Bayun Lake Park in Gangangangju caught sight of the animal on February 9th and snapped some photos. There had been previous sightings of this gargantuan beast, but no one had gotten close enough to look to identify its species. The ranger told the Gangju Daily, that the creature looked about two meters long. Another employee gave local video news site Pier a more detailed if bizarre description. The back of the, the creature looked like that of a turtle and was black. Afterwards, it showed its head and it looked like a snake's head. Alarmed staff members immediately put up warning signs around the lake, warning people not to go in. Local media dubbed the mysterious animal the killer in the water. Thanks to its large size and sharp teeth and speculated that the ferocious beast might wreak havoc on the lake's ecosystem by eating the other inhabitants. Experts were called in to look at the photos and determined that the animal was probably an alligator gar, one of the world's largest freshwater fish. That's what they want you to believe, Tim. Mm -hmm. That's what they need you to believe. A team of rangers set about catching the gar, finally reeled in two on the fresh or of the fish on Monday. Neither of them measured up to the promised two meters. One was 1.2 meters in length. The other was just 0 .0 or 0 0.9 meters. This might mean the ranger who saw the gar early in February exaggerated its size, as men are wont to do, or it could mean there's still a huge creature lurking in the lake. Believed to be more than 100 million years old, the species is known as living fossils because they still have physical characteristics of their early ancestors, such as the ability to breathe both air and water, Tim. The largest alligator gar ever recorded measured a whopping 2.5 meters in length. Although there have been rumors of fishes measuring more than 3 meters, the fish are an unusual sight in Asia, as their populations are located primarily in the lakes, swamps, and bayous of the southern United States. Last week, Texas wildlife agencies proposed new regulations to protect alligator gar from overfishing. Park employees have theorized alligator gar may have entered the lake in 2013 when a reservoir gate separating the lake 
from the Pearl River was lifted. I'm never going swimming in a public water hole ever again, Tim. <laughs> never ever. All right, how many more stories have you got? I got just one. All right, what do you got? Uh, this story is about why an outlaw was stabbed to death and buried face down in medieval Sicily. Hmm. I think it was just because they were mean people, but hey. Could I mean, be. That's, that's why I'm not an archaeologist. I would give up easily. I would just <laughs> take a look at the burial site and go, this is what I think, and I'd leave. Uh, hundreds of years, actually, in uh, medieval Sicily, a man was stabbed multiple times in the back, buried in a really weird way, and lost to history. Now, hundreds of years later, archaeologists have excavated evidence of this ancient crime in the Piazza Armerian, Sicily, uh, the researchers found the man's skeleton lying face down in a shallow pit, empty of any funerian objects typical of any ancient burials. Uh, the body was buried in a position that was unusual for that time period. They reported last month in the International Journal of Osteoarchaeology. Uh, the evidence suggested that the man lived in the 11th century and was between 30 and 40 years old when he died using CT scans and 3D reconstructions. Uh, the researchers set out to determine how he died and why his burial was so unusual. According to the report, there was evidence of six cuts on the individual's sternum, and there were indicative of stab wounds likely inflicted by a knife or dagger. On the right side of his sternum, the researchers found a chop mark where a piece of bone had been removed, likely by a twisting motion from the weapon. There was no evidence of other injuries on the man's vertebra or... Uh, Ribs that would suggest that the man was involved in some kind of uncontrolled fight, said lead author Roberto Michier, uh, an archaeologist at the University of Palermo in Italy. The goal of the man's killer, it seems, was to attack the victim in a very effective and rapid way, Michier said. In addition, the assailant likely knew human anatomy very well. In fact, the cuts were so clean and smooth that the man may have been immobilized, perhaps with binding. Uh, the man's feet were also squished together in the burial space, which further supports the idea that his feet were bound together. Using CT scans, the researchers were able to determine that the angle and size of the man's stab wounds, uh, information that the investigators then used to create a 3D reconstruction of where the sharp object dug into the sternum and chest cage, uh, because the blade of the knife would have entered the man's upper back at an angle, the researchers think that the man was kneeling on the ground at the time of the stabbing, Michier went on to say. Uh, since the knife pierced through the thorax, the part of the body where the neck and the abdomen uh, meet and into the man's breastbone, Michier said the weapon likely punctured the man's lung and heart repeatedly, so he probably died very quickly. And then there's the weirdness of the burial, the first well-documented case of a deviant burial in Sicily. The burial is atypical because it does not follow any religious prescription in the arrangement of the body, Michier said. Uh, during this time in Sicily, three major monotheistic religions coexisted, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Each had different traditions in burying its dead. Jews Christ and Christians of the Middle Ages buried their dead face up, while Muslims buried their body lying on its right side so that the head faced southeast towards Mecca. The skeleton, on the other hand, was buried face down. Atypical burials tend to be the result of a superstitious belief, such as if people think the dead person is a vampire or has returned from the dead, or an indication that the person was an outlaw. Uh, he said he thinks in this case that it's the latter. If in his life the individual was not aligned to the social order of the community, his burial should reflect this lack of conformity in death, Michier said. Uh, all of this is to say that the man was likely an exile of sorts who was executed. What's more, this was a time of crisis and social reorganization that occurred right after the Norman conquest of Sicily in 1061. As everywhere in any time during a period of socio-political rearrangement, it is possible to note that an increase in violent acts among people, uh, Michier said. Now, Michier and his team are looking through medieval archaeological records to find evidence of weapons that could be compatible with marks on the skeleton and move towards a, a step closer uh, to solving this ancient game of Clue. That's the story. All right. Well, let's uh, take a quick break. We'll come back. We've got some of your stories to share on Parish Air next here on Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness, listeners. If you like this show, then you need to check out CarCast because it's the longest running automotive podcast. And if... 
you're anything like Dave and I and you know a little bit about cars and you need to know more about cars, then CarCast is definitely the podcast you need to check out. CarCast is a twice-weekly automotive show hosted by Adam Carolla, wrestling superstar Bill Goldberg, and Matt the Motorator D'Andrea. It's the only show of its kind that explores all aspects of the automotive space, from the performance aftermarket to new car buying and the future of the automotive industry. The guys answer your questions, they offer advice and feature guests from the automotive industry and celebrity car enthusiasts. Listen to CarCast with Goldberg and Motorator Matt D'Andrea every Wednesday and Adam Carolla with Motorator every Friday on the Podcast One app or iTunes Podcasts. Beyond the Darkness. Welcome back to the program. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That cuddly fell over there. Well, that's Tim Dennis. And now it's time, Tim, for people's stories. We have a couple questions. We have a couple stories. Let's begin with a question, shall we? Sure. And remember, if you'd like to call in and be a part of our show, 651-300-4977. 651-300-4977. Call that number. And tell us your story, and we will play it on an upcoming episode. Hey, Dave and Tim, I want to run this story by you both to see what you think. My grandmother passed away about six years ago. She was the most loving, kind, and selfless person I will ever know. I was very close to her. Anyway, funeral day came and went, and it was over. The family got together to eat and celebrate my grandmother's loving life. After all was over, I went home to change out of my suit and get lounge clothes on. I go to my room and go to my closet and almost instantaneously the closet light flicked on and off three times as if my grandma was responding with i love you i would like to think it was grandma telling me that she loves me but i'm not sure any coincidental electrical glitch a response i don't know dave what do you think i tried sending this to you but i don't think it went through before love your show and your voice impressions thanks dave that comes from Brian. See, Brian likes my many voices that all sound like this. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I, I would guess, you know, if it felt loving to you and you got that impression, if that was the first impression pressed upon you, I would guess that's probably the message that they're sending to you. I'm sorry, it wasn't deeper of an answer, but that's uh, that's what I'd get out of that whole deal. I can relate something that happened. Uh, this would be the first time I related this on the show. Um, it's kind of personal, but I, I guess I could relate it. And happened okay. happened the uh, the day my stepdad died. The actual day he died. Um, actually, it happened. Um, it would have been within the first twenty four hours, and it was. But it was things were happening around the house um, after they had taken his body um, to the the, the coroner and we were cleaning up Um, and things were happening around the house, like physically happening around the house. But it was in the house that he resided. Um, He hated the fact that the, the bedroom door would be closed. So he kept trying to close the door and the door kept opening at one point. Um, you could lock the door from the outside. I, I think if I remember right, you could lock the door from the outside. And we were trying to lock the door, and the door wouldn't stay locked, and it would open. Um, and at one point, all the lights in the house were flickering to and fro, um, like the, like Pop was trying to travel through the house, like almost like he was agitated or frustrated, like he was trying to let us know that he was there. That's how I took that, and it wow. was it was weird because it was um, it was uh, he Pop had a belief he had a belief that when he passed away he'd he'd scatter to the four winds that he would become one with the earth and that he, he um, and that would be it you know that but I think he was surprised that when he passed away he was still kind of earthbound you know for that little bit of time like he could see us we could you know. We couldn't see him, but he could see us, and I think he was 
trying to holler at us to let us know that he was there. What was really weird is I went out onto the porch and I was streaming and I was listening to you. Actually, I was listening to you doing the show and was listening to you make mention of the fact that, you know, pop had passed away and whatnot. And what was, and it still kind of raises the hair on my, on my uh, arm. When I think about it, all of a sudden, all these, uh, coyotes started to howl at one time and it sounded like there was a hundred of them like all around it like all around the house because they had lived in a mother-in-law house on a farm and i was sitting outside with my sister and it sounded like they were surrounding the house and you just heard this big Arr! and it was scary i mean it, it sounded but it's it, not it, it it sounded almost like a mournful cry and then all of a sudden just they all stopped at the same time but it went on for what seemed like a minute or two. And then it stopped. It stopped dead cold. And then the porch light where we were sitting outside started to flicker. It was flickering on and off and on and off and on and off. And then went dead. And then I went inside to see if, you know, maybe it was just a problem with the outside light. And as I went in to try and flip the switch, the light went back on again and stayed on. It was just weird, like all these different things started happening. And then the next day, as we were making the funeral arrangements, nothing. So I think it was just his way of, uh, that was his way of just saying, hey, 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 you know what? I'm still here, you know, I'm still here, I'm still here. Um. So when, when people do say that, you know, when they do give their experiences of saying hey you know what I, I wonder if that is grandma or if that is someone signaling to say i'm still here i'm still here i do have that story of i'm still here i'm still here but that was so overwhelmingly violent that 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 experience that i went through that i i can't deny that that's one of those things one of those experiences that i can't deny um I don't Maybe know. he knew you'd be skeptical, and that's why he made it so profound, so that it would kind of lift that le level of skepticism. So we wouldn't be just, oh, that must have been a breeze. Oh or yeah. Oh, I don't something. Doubt it. Yeah. At, at one point, you know, we at one point we had shut every because the door kept opening to the bedroom. We had shut every window in the house. I mean, I said because I, and, and I even measured. I was starting to get really skeptical. I had measured the gradients. Uh, angle of the of the floor to make sure that it wasn't that the door was uneven that that was what was making the the doors you know close open and close and that it was complete oh, it was almost completely level you mm. know there was nothing that should have made the door and i sat and i watched it you know my, my, my sister and i were sitting there watching the door open and close and my sister was freaked out for a bit you know and in a way, it was it was kind of cool, but in a way, it was kind of freaky. It was like, what the fuck? And and it finally, we were just sitting there on the porch, going, "We know you're here," you know. Once we started acknowledging, "We know you're here. It's okay. We know you're here." It started to slow down, you know. Wow! Yeah. Very powerful. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, Dave and Tim and Tim and Dave. I apologize in advance for any spelling or grammatical errors. It's late, and it took me way longer to write this than I thought it or imagined it would. I came back and added this after I was finished. My name is Adam. I live on the east coast of Canada. Shout out to Jordan Bonaparte of the Nighttime Podcast. And I have been listening to your show for about a year and a half. Anyway, I'll cut the BS and get on with my story. The story takes place on Cape Breton Island in the province of Nova Scotia. And I'll begin with a little backstory of how it started. In 2009, my girlfriend, her four-year-old son, and I were living in Calgary, Alberta. We decided in the spring of 2010 that we wanted to move back to Nova Scotia. I'm originally from there, and she spent much of her childhood between Nova Scotia and Ontario. While researching job opportunities, rental properties, etc. on Kiji, not sure if you have Kiji, Kagigi, uh, pronounced Kagigi in the United States, but think of it as like the Craigslist, but uh, less seedy and murderish. <laughs> <laughs> She came across a listing for a home sale that was unbelievably cheap. After speaking with the seller a few times, we arranged for one of the relatives to meet the seller and view the home. Everything went on and uh, seemed to go just fine. We paid for an inspector to view the house 
it, he gave it the green light. So we scraped up the money and within a few weeks bought the home, essentially sight unseen. Over the next two months, we tied up all of our loose ends in Calgary, sold all of our belongings other than our clothes and our son's toys, which we packed up in our truck and had, the, had them shipped to Nova Scotia to await our arrival a few weeks later. I'm going to give a little history lesson on the area we were about to move into. Cape Breton Island was a major hub for coal mining and steel making between 19 or 1850 and 1920. The Cape Breton Company houses were by large built by the mining and steel companies to house workers and their families. A company house is basically a duplex, one side of a mirror image of the other side. I attached a picture in this email for your reference. In June 2010, we boarded a plane and headed for our new company home. Once we arrived, we immediately started doing what we could do to make it uh, feel like a house. It needed more renovations for sure, but uh, that would have to wait. On the second or third day there, I was working around the house while my girlfriend and her son were running errands in town. While I was giving the lawn a much-needed mowing, one of the neighbors invited me to their side of the uh, company house for a drink. We sat and talked for about an hour During that time, I inquired on the history of the house. I'll get to that soon. But after what our neighbor say, but after what our neighbor Kay told me, I decided not to share this information with my girlfriend. As time goes on, some strange things begin to happen. The first thing I can recall is this: one evening, while sitting in the dining room assembling some shelves or something that we bought, I heard the distinctive sound of someone hitting a broad ran. Or Badrun, that's how they said. I like how he gives me the pronunciation afterwards, <laughs> which is a Celtic hand drum right by my ear three times in a row. I said, what the hell was that? Followed by my girlfriend saying from the other room, what are you doing? I told her it wasn't me that did that, and it sounded like someone hitting a drum right beside me. Several weeks later, I was talking to my girlfriend while getting ready for the bathroom. I could see tiny balls of light swirling around behind her. I turned, her, I turned to her and told her to look. But there was nothing there. Several more weeks go by and nothing out of the ordinary happens. Then, one afternoon, while downstairs, I hear my girlfriend yell to me from the upstairs ba- uh, bathroom. I make my way up there and she says, something weird just happened. While she was getting a shower, she noticed the bathroom was getting very steamed up. She finished up as quickly as she could and she pulled back the shower curtain. She said it was like the bathroom was filled with fog so thick she couldn't even see the wall or the opposite side of the room that was only about 10 feet. And then in a matter of seconds, it dissipated, just made it completely gone. Some more time goes by uneventfully, and I started a job at refrigeration and air conditioning tech at company, and I worked hard for contracts renovating grocery stores. So I began doing back shifts. Also, my stepson began school around the same time, and he uh, and he came from one of those schools with a craft that made he made all by himself. So being proud parents, we wanted to put it on display. She suggested hanging it in the living room. I suggested hanging it in the dining room, and after some back and forth, we decided to hang it in the dining room. It's a little vicious or little victories, huh, guys? I come away from the back shift the next morning, and the craft is unpinned from the wall and sitting on the table. I pin it back up and forgot about it. I come home the next morning, and again, it's unpinned and on the table. I pin it back up and forgot about it. Once again, the next morning, I get home. Sure enough, there is the craft on the table. This time, I think, okay, what game is my girlfriend playing here? So I leave it on the table. That night, we're having our good night phone call. I'm at work, and she mentions, why did you take the craft off the wall? To which I responded, I didn't take it down. You did. Just hang it in the living room where you wanted to. I don't mind. Neither of us believed the other and thought the other one was just messing around. That doesn't seem like the case now in hindsight. One evening in the fall, my girlfriend worked the late shift, so I was going to get her son ready for school the next morning. When I got home from my back shift so she could sleep in, after I see her son off to school, I decided to lay down on the couch and watch some TV for a bit. She slept, and then I'd heard the bed uh, once she got up for the day. So I'm sitting there, and my phone rings. I look down. It's my girlfriend calling. I think to myself, oh, she's up already. She isn't a great sleeper on her best days. I pick up the phone and say, good morning. Nothing. No response. So I say, hello, hello. Still no response. So I hang up and continue watching TV. A few minutes pass and my phone rings again. I look down and it's her calling again. I pick up and say once again, good morning, Jay. Still no response. Hello, hello. No response. But it almost sounded like light breathing on the other end. I hang up and 
right away, uh, again, my phone rings, and again, it's her. I pick up the phone and say, is everything okay? No response, so I hung up and went down or went upstairs. I opened the door, and there is uh, my girlfriend sound asleep in bed. I know for a fact she was sleeping. You can just tell when someone is legitimately sleeping or not. I wake her up and say, did you just call me? She says, no, obviously not. I'm clearly sleeping. So I tell her what just happened. And she says that she doesn't, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Phones don't just make calls on their own. We checked her call history and there were no recent outgoing calls made from her phone to mine. Yet my call history showed three calls in the last 10 minutes. I still can't explain that one, guys. The last one I'm going to tell you creeps me out from time to time, even now, almost nine years later. While at work one evening, just before Christmas, my girlfriend texted me and said, can you call when you get a chance? Something really creepy just happened, and I'm kind of freaking out. I called as soon as I could get here, and uh, this is what she told me. Like every other night before bed, it was story time for her son, and they uh, said their good nights. She tucked him in, shut off the light, and closed the door, leaving it open just a few inches, since that is the way he preferred it. She immediately headed to the bathroom to get herself ready for bed. While in there, she said she could hear her son in the bedroom laughing. After a few minutes of this, she thought he was just goofing around. So she yells out, it's bedtime, not playtime. Seconds later, her son opens the bathroom door and says, how did you do that, mommy? She says, what do you mean? Do what, honey? And he says, yell to me from the bathroom at the same time you're playing with me in my bedroom. Then he tells her after she shuts his door and oh, over and left a few seconds later the door opened again and he says he had seen her poke her head back in the door then back out and stuck her hands around the side of the door and tapping up and down and up and down along the door and you were making shadow puppets on the walls from the light shining through my door and i thought that uh we're so good that's why i was i was laughing i thought they were so good that's why i was laughing then you yelled from the bathroom and i didn't know how you did that she just sat there in silence for a second and then said or and then he said and how did you make yourself look so old she said at that point she was terrified and said do you want to sleep in mommy's bed tonight so what did my neighbor Kay tell me about those months previous well it turns out the former owner of the house was a nice old lady who lived in that house for over 50 years her husband was a minor who had died young, and she raised four boys all on her own. She lived there alone for most of her life in the last years, and in fact had died there just before we bought the house, and it turns out they found her body on the bathroom floor. We ended up selling and moving to Halifax after less than a year of owning the place. It was for reasons completely unrelated to these stories. We never once felt threatened. It's just a little bit freaky, and we never felt scared for our safety or anything like that. Also, I'm I'm sure there were other incidents, but I just can't think of any right now. Take care, guys. Love your show. Keep up the good work. Oh, I have other stories, too, completely unrelated to these. But guess what, Dave? Guess what, Tim? No. Yeah. No. That's right. I'll save those for another time. <sighs> I come from Adam in Canada, the bastard. I hope he's denied Texas barbecue for the rest of his life. You think that's his uh, nickname? What's the that? bastard? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah could be. Yep. Yeah. Could be. Every car comes with its share of stories. That ding in your bumper when you nervously picked up your first date, the luxury package you got after a big promotion, or the mileage you saved by riding your bike all summer. While you can't put a price tag on your stories, now with True Car, you can at least find out what your car's worth when it comes time to sell or trade it in. Just go to True Car, simply enter your license plate number and watch how the car details pop up. Then answer a few questions. Navigation and moonroof? Watch as they bump up your value. How about high mileage? You already knew that was going to cost you, but now you know how much it dings your wallet so you can plan ahead. Once you're finished, you're going to get a true cash offer sent in minutes, which you can take to a local certified dealer or cash out or trade in. So when you're ready to experience a better way to sell or trade in your car, check out True Car today. True cash offers may not be available in all states. All right, Tim. A couple more quickies? Sure. That's what she said. Hi, Dave and Tim. I was listening to Friday's show when you and Tim were discussing EVPs. Well, this is a little bit of an older email from 2006. Oh, yes. On Memorial Day 2006, our neighbor Alice, who had been in poor health for many years, passed away. It was truly a blessing to have known her. A few days later, I was asked by her daughter if it would be possible to watch Alice's house since it was now vacant. Her daughter was worried about vandalism, so of course I said yes. On the first day I walked the perimeter of her house, I decided to use the Voice Memos app on my phone to validate my findings. After checking all front doors and looking through the windows, I found myself on the back porch. I was looking into the living room and kitchen and, and got a whiff of cigarettes that engulfed me. 
I can't. I don't have a sense of smell, so I was quite surprised to smell cigarettes. I then remembered Alice was a heavy smoker. Cigarette smells happened to those uh, to more times on various days while I was watching her house, and always in the same location. The next day, I walked the perimeter of her house using my voice memos, and again, as I reached the bedroom window at the back porch, I made uh, I note that nothing was out of the ordinary. I then told Alice that we missed her, and if she had anything she wanted to say, she could do it into my iPhone. I then headed home. As I started getting ready to go shopping, I remember the audio recording and started listening to it. As I listened to myself talking about Alice's bedroom, I could hear what sounds like a woman saying the same word twice right over her. Kitty, kitty. I couldn't believe it. I didn't hear that at the time of the recording. I believe Alice wanted to know what happened to the cat Felix. Alice's daughter, who lives in California, took Felix home with her. I was felt that uh, Alice was asking about her cat. I went back down to the location where I caught the EVP and told her Felix was now living in California with her mother. Oh, on the way back home, I actually had a different woman's voice say thank you. I've attached a trimmed version of the audio and... Due to the taping on the iPhone, it's easier to hear using earbuds. We won't play those for you, folks, because it was almost impossible to hear. But thanks again, Dave and Tim, for making Darkness Radio a safe haven for people to share their experiences. Thank you so much. And that comes from Elaine. Well, thank you, Elaine. It's always our pleasure to serve and protect. Is that what we do, Tim? Serve and protect? Well, we serve. I don't know about protect. but you know. Wow. Yeah. Not with that attitude, we don't. <laughs> Psychic Source wants us to remind you that your life path doesn't have to be a mystery. It's okay to ask for a little guidance sometimes, and you'll be so glad you did. Try your first reading today at a super discounted rate. Just 83 cents a minute. Don't forget to mention promo code DARKNESS when you call or sign up online at PsychicSource.com. Still not sure? Save the number just in case. 1-800-355-9214. That's 1-800-355-9214. Use code word DARKNESS for those deep discounts. Well, that's it for this week. We are done with today's program. We will be back tomorrow. We've got a very special presentation lined up for you. It is a great episode uh, that I recorded last week live on board the Pearl, which is uh, the the Walker Stalker final cruise. We had a lot of fun there. So I recorded it um, along with a couple of guests and a big audience fully willing and ready to share their ghostly and weird encounters. So that's tomorrow on the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. For that guy, I'm this guy. You've been listening to Beyond the Darkness.